All right, yes. Good morning, church. Welcome to Grace Fellowship. Hey, if you're outside, you can, hey, you, can, you can come inside if you're outside. Hey, church, we're going to get started with worship right now. So if you can, please stand. And we'll begin this time with the uh, from Scripture. So, <clears throat> Psalm 29.2 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. Let's pray, church. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all that you've given us and continue to give us, God. Thank you for providing us with this time and um, this building. God, thank you for doing so much for us. Um, we're so thankful that we serve such a good God. Um, Lord, I pray that we can use these things you've given us to your glory. And uh, just lift your name on high as we worship you in spirit and truth this morning. God, we pray that our worship is satisfying to you and, and holy and pleasing to you, God. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God, that's our prayer this morning. 
God, will you help us to know you more, God? Your ways are so unfathomable, and it's at times difficult to truly grasp what you're doing, whether it's in this world, in our life, God, but God, I ask that you would help us to look at your word this morning and truly understand what, what you are doing what, and what is the heart behind your actions and your thoughts. God, help us to really understand you more in this time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Today we're going to be looking at the last half of Matthew chapter 2. If you remember last week, uh, we looked at the coming of the wise men and the significance of the story in relationship to them. Now remember, in relationship to the book of Matthew, there is a connection between Matthew chapters 1 and 2. In Matthew chapter 1, you have all the genealogy proving that Jesus is part of the Davidic line, the heir of the Davidic throne. And then in chapter 2, you have the conflict between the kings of the world and the conflict between uh, God's anointed. So this is kind of an archetypical rivalry that exists. Uh, not only did it happen between Herod and Christ at the time of his infancy, but it still continues to exist in the world today. Uh, we're going to begin at uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, and it says this. It says, now when they had departed, that is, when the wise men had departed from seeing Jesus, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and he lived in, the city, in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called the Nazarene. Well, that's the section we're going to look at. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another morning that you have given us to be able to gather and to think about you and to look at your word. And I think that today's message maybe <laughs> is a little bit uh, uh, d maybe difficult to grasp or difficult to apply to our lives. And I pray that you would be with us as we think about these things, um, that we would be amazed by you and the way that you work in the world, and that we would learn to trust you more in the midst of every circumstance that we're in. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the theme kind of as I saw it, you know, so last week the theme was rival kings. This week it's the same story, but there's another theme that I want to bring out, and that's the theme of the sovereignty of God in the life of Christ. And the reason why it struck me as this being a theme is just so much that is mentioned here about the intervention of God and the prophecies that are fulfilled and everything. Uh, that, that show us that God is involved in the processes that are taking place here. I mean, three times in the chapter, in these two chapters, Matthew 1 and 2, uh, in a dream, actually it would be four times in a, in a dream, uh, Joseph is spoken to in some way by God, three times by an angel. In other words, you remember first when Mary became pregnant and Joseph was worried about taking her as his wife, that an angel appeared to him and said, don't be afraid to marry her. Uh, because that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And then we have the warning to Joseph in a dream to flee to Egypt because Herod is going to come and kill the babies. 
Then we have the, the uh, they're, they're told they can return to Egypt again by means of an angel in a dream. And then as they're returning into Israel, Joseph has another dream that tells him, hey, go to Galilee and go live in Nazareth. I mean, don't, don't live in the area that you're picking because Archelaus, Herod's son, is there. So all of those things happen. But then you have other things that are taking place too. You have the guidance of the wise men by the star, and you have the wise men also having a dream. And then in these two chapters, you have five prophecies that, fulfill, that are fulfilled. So that's a huge volume of interaction of God with these people in these verses. And to me, it just sticks out that God's intent is to let us know that he's in control of these different things in the world and that he's sovereign. Um, so we had read earlier that Herod had told the wise men that once they find Jesus, come back and tell him, and he'll go and he'll worship them. And now we find in verses 13 to 18 that that wasn't his intent at all. He's intending to kill Jesus so that there wouldn't be any rival to the throne. And so it says in verse 14 that Joseph had this dream and that he took Mary and Jesus by night and they fled for Egypt. And, you know, a number of people comment on that as, you know, he left by night. Some people think that it's under the cover of darkness he would have avoided uh, being arrested or being caught by Herod, and that's possible. But I think it more stresses the urgency of what's taking place. Joseph has this dream and in the dream, an angel tells him, hey, somebody's going to kill Jesus. Herod wants to kill Jesus. Of course, that's an upsetting dream. He wakes up, he grabs Mary and Jesus, and they flee for Egypt immediately before the sun even rises. And to me, this especially makes sense because you've got to realize that Bethlehem is only two hours' walk from Jerusalem. So as soon as Herod gives that, that order to kill the babies in Bethlehem, two hours later, the killing spree could begin. So they could be there very early in the morning. So they leave and they go to, uh, to Egypt. Can you imagine? <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I had kind of a stressful morning uh, this morning. It was stressful all until now. You know, I mean, it was like really. And, but I think, you know, I kind of look at my life from my perspective. But you look at this. Can you imagine if you wake up in a dream, an angel appears to your husband in a dream and says they're going to kill your kid. And now you got to just grab everything and go. You don't have a car. You can't call the police. You know, there's nothing you can do. You haven't made provisions. You just grab what you have and you, and you run and you flee for Egypt. And that was the situation that God uh, had, had laid out in history. Now, throughout history, the Jews have fled to Egypt. Uh, it had been kind of a safe haven for them. And if you look at a map, of Egypt, you'll find that to the border of Egypt from Bethlehem, the, the closest border was about 75 miles or a three to four day walk. But uh, the thing that I think is interesting, especially in talking about the sovereignty of God, is that God had even prepared the country of Egypt to be receptive to Mary and Joseph when they went there. Years before, 300 plus years before, Alexander the Great, who was a Roman, conquered Egypt and he kind of laid out the city of Alexandria, and he even designated a place in that city for Jews. They even built a temple for the Jews in Alexandria. And by the way, for those of you who are interested, it was probably in Alexandria, Egypt, that the Greek translation of the New Testament, uh, I mean of the Old Testament, also took place. So all of these things happened within Egypt, and it was a good place for Jews to go. And so uh, when Joseph and Mary and Jesus left. They were going to a place where they would receive welcome and safe haven, which had been prepared in advance through the conquering of Egypt by Alexander the Great. And then in verse 15, it says that they remained there uh, until the death of Herod, which we had mentioned before was about 4 BC, and uh, then they returned to Israel. Now, as we read this story, the interesting part of it is, is that most of the story focuses on the events. And again, remember my theme is the sovereignty of God in the world, and I kind of want to emphasize this. The majority of events are talking about them going to Egypt, right? What were the circumstances that caused them to go to Egypt? But the real point in going to Egypt is so that they can leave Egypt and go back to Israel, and by doing that, it's the return from Egypt to Israel that the prophecy is fulfilled in Hosea 11.1, 1, 
out of Egypt I called my son. Now, when we start thinking about the sovereignty of God, you know, it gets more and more complex and more and more amazing uh, the more that we think about it. Uh, the sovereignty of God is the fact that God rules over all the world, that everything that happens in the world is according to God's plan and his purposes. And I think a point that I want to make today uh, is that a lot of the things that God is doing now may not seem very significant to us in our day and our age, but they may have ramifications a thousand years from now if Christ uh, doesn't return before then. So as we look at history, we find that the sovereignty of God and the planning of God goes way back in order to have events like this coming out of Egypt come to pass. And I just want you to kind of think through it with me this morning. Now, I have a number of pages worth of notes back there, and I encourage you to pick those up because it covers a lot of the more technical things within the passage that I'm not going to cover this morning. So I encourage you to look at that. But just think for a moment, uh, at Jesus' birth, or around the time of Jesus' birth, there were a number of things that had to be fulfilled. Uh, he had to have been born of a virgin. Uh, he had to have been of the Davidic line. He had to have been born in Bethlehem. And even though he was born in Bethlehem, he had to be called a Nazarene. And not only that, uh, during that time, during some time period, he had to be called out of Egypt in order to fulfill these different prophecies. Now, the prophecy about being called out of Egypt was written about 710 B.C., so 700 years before this happened, uh, this prophecy was given. Now, let's think through some of these events, and I'm hoping that as you think through these things, you'll be more and more amazed at the way that God works and have a better understanding about the way that God works, primarily the fact that what we see on the outside of the world, we are not going to be able to interpret. You know, we're not going to be able to look at our life and look at the lives of people and look at the events in the world and say, based on this, this is going to happen, because this could be a part of the puzzle that doesn't affect something until a thousand years later down the line and we'll be long gone and dead. So Hosea is written in 710 BC, the prophecy happens. But think about Bethlehem. You know, Jesus had to have been born in Bethlehem. Now, I'm kind of a simple-minded person, and if I was God, I would have just had Jesus and, and Mary living in Bethlehem. Wouldn't that have been a lot easier if the baby's going to be born in Bethlehem? Have them live there. And then when the baby's born, they don't have to go looking around and traveling and finding a place to stay in and then end up having the baby born and laid in a manger. We wouldn't have to have any of that take place. But that wasn't the way that God determined to work. Instead, he had Joseph and Mary living in Nazareth, and she's pregnant in Nazareth, and then he uses the decree of a secular ruler, Caesar Augustus, uh, to have a census in which everybody has to register in their hometown. Joseph, who was born in Bethlehem, that was his home hometown, now had to return to Bethlehem. Now, if you were Joseph living under those circumstances, he was a godly man, I'm not so much, I think I would have responded much you know, kind of negatively, like, man, you got to be kidding. Why is Caesar, you know, having this census where we got to go to our hometowns in order to register, and then I'd kind of be complaining to Mary, you know, man, and not only that, look, you're pregnant. You're about to burst. You're going to have a baby. What a horrible time. The timing on this thing is horrible. I couldn't think of worse timing than this. Couldn't it, wouldn't it have been better if we would have known about this six months earlier or a couple years later? He could have done the decree then. But that wasn't part of God's purposes, because if it would have happened six months later or years, la years later, then the prophecy that Jesus would have had to have been born in Bethlehem would have been fulfilled. So God uses this decree to bring them to Bethlehem, and it seems like no sooner did they get there that Jesus is born and prophecy comes to pass. And what about this, about Jesus, God calling his son in this case, Jesus, out of Egypt. Well, again, if I were God, I wouldn't have done it like that. You know, uh, Joseph, what was he, like a tradesman, a carpenter, or a stonemason, or something like that? I would have had him be a trader. 
We're an international trader. That's what I would have had the guy's job be. And then I'd have the story go, well, not only were they living in Bethlehem and had the baby, Joseph had business in Egypt, the family goes to Egypt, and then I call my son out of Egypt. Yay, a lot easier way to do that. But again, that's not God's intentions and purposes. They, they were people who had no intention of traveling to Egypt. They had no reason to go there at all. But God must move the family to Egypt through the circumstances or through divine revelation. Somehow he's got to get the family to Egypt because he must fulfill what he has said, out of Egypt I have called my son. So how does he do it? Did he do it in a way that you and I would do it? I don't think so. He uses this paranoid, murderous king to threaten to kill the baby in order to move them to Egypt. Now, you think about this story, and the more details you think about when we put this story together, the more and more complicated it becomes. So Herod, you know, Jesus had been born. He was maybe up to two years old and living in Bethlehem, and Herod was oblivious to the fact that the king of the Jews were there. Well, if God wants to move the people, his fam- this family, out of Israel into Egypt by threat of Herod, if that's the way that God wants to do it, he needs to awaken Herod to the fact that there's a rival king that's living in Bethlehem. And the way that he does it is the way that we talked about last week, through Gentiles who come to Jerusalem from Babylon and ask, where is the one who is born king of the Jews? Now again, bear with me as we think about God's sovereign purposes in the world. We know that the wise men came from Babylon But in order for them to come to Babylon, the nation of Babylon had to exist. And wise men within the nation had to exist. In other words, you can't have wise men come from Babylon if they don't exist yet. So in the sovereign purposes of God, hundreds, thousands of years before that, God is developing a nation, Babylon, that is going to be a superpower in the world. And within that nation is a cast of men who are wise men, who are learned in astrology and astronomy and natural medicine and in sci- and sciences. And he's going to use them in order to bring this to pass. But how is he going to communicate to them? What's going to motivate them to go to Jerusalem and talk to Herod? Well, what motivates them is really the rebellion of God's own people. The nation of Judah, the, the kingdom of Judah, rebels against God, and this country, Babylon, that God in his sovereign plan had raised up, comes down and takes them into captivity, and with them he takes Daniel the prophet. Well, while Daniel's the prophet is there, circumstances come, a dream to Nebuchadnezzar and all these different things, and Daniel becomes known as a wise and compassionate individual and becomes head of these wise men. You know, this is a story you could not write. If you put this in a movie, nobody would believe it. But this is the way that God is working in all of these events to bring these, these things to come to pass. 600 years after Daniel is there, the memory of the things that he had taught and the things that he had written in the prophecy of Daniel are still in these wise men's mind. They see a star, they're astronomers, and they put a connection. Somehow God puts a connection to them, and they head and they go to Jerusalem. They follow the star. It ends up they go to Jerusalem. Now, you know, later in this story, it says that the star stood over the place where Jesus was. Why didn't it just do that right away? Why did they go to Jerusalem? Now, we don't really know the answer to that, but we know in their going to Jerusalem and asking about where the king of the Jews was, that is what aroused the fury of Herod that caused him to want to go and kill Jesus. Could you put this story together? Do you think that the people in Babylon, as this nation is developing in Babylon, they were thinking to themselves, you know what, someday we're going to have a cast of wise men that are going to be met by some Jewish guy and we're going to go down and and fulfill prophecy. They didn't think that. Do you think that Caesar Augustus thought by having a census where people have to return to their hometown that it was going to be fulfilling prophecy? No, I'm sure he didn't think that. Do you think that Herod the Great by wanting to kill Jesus, 
was going to actually be a pawn in the hands of God that is going to fulfill prophecy when Jesus returns to Egypt, I don't think any of those things would have taken place had they thought, you know, that they were part of it. But all of this happened. And so we find that in the scriptures it says that when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. What does that mean? It means when all, you know, when all the pieces of the puzzle, when all the parts were lined up, when God had the, the nation of Babylon developed to the point where they could send wise men, when God had a king in place who is going to be a paranoid, murderous person, when God had set the stage in Egypt so that the family could go to Egypt and return, when God, in a smaller sense, when God had provided the family with gifts from the wise men in order that they could finance the trip, you know, even down to that detail, when all of these things had come to, to fullness, when all of them culminated, God sends his son and begins to work out all of these prophecies and all of these things related to him. The prophets in the Old Testament often didn't even know what they were saying. There was, there was a meaning that they had when they spoke it, and there was a meaning that God had as he wrote through them. So you have, in the writing of scriptures, you have a combination of man and God writing the scriptures. People are writing as they're thinking. They're writing in their own language. They're writing in the ways that they would speak. And yet God is superintending them so that what is written is exactly what God wants them to say. And he has Hosea write, out of Egypt I called my son. In Hosea's mind, he's thinking, my son is Israel, and he's referring back to the Exodus. Out of Egypt I called my son. But that wasn't the intent of God in him writing that. God was intending to bring Jesus out of Egypt back into Israel and fulfill prophecy in the process of doing that. And so as you go through the scriptures, you find that things in the life of Jesus parallel things in the life of the nation. We've talked about this a number of times. The fulfillment of prophecy is not simply a one-by-one -one correspondence. You know, the Savior, will, the, the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Okay, got that, one-to-one. -one. It's not always like that. There's a connection between the history of Israel as God sovereignly worked within it and the life of Jesus. There are things that are parallel. Not only the exodus of a newborn nation out of Egypt, but the exodus of a newborn son, an infant son, out of Egypt. Not only is Israel the vine of God, Jesus is the vine, the true vine. Israel didn't produce fruit, it says. It produced sour fruit. Israel could not do what Jesus does in producing the fruit of God. When we go through the temptation of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, you find Jesus is driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, and he's, he's there for 40 days being tested, or this word can be translated tempted or tested. Israel was in the wilderness for 40, day, for 40 years. There's a parallel. Satan tempts Jesus. Jesus answers with words that are found in the Exodus experience. And on and on and on and this goes. And humans, there's no way that we can put all of this together. And I guess, I guess the point that I want to bring out to us by way of application is there is no way that you are going to be able to look at your life and determine the things that are happening in your life or the lives of other people or in the lives of this country or another country, how they're part of the grand plan of God. It's just too complicated. You can look at somebody who's in sin and saying, how can that ever, that's horrible. They're just useless for God when in reality, through their sin, God may use that in a series of events that through history is going to work out in such and such a way. And, you know, this is one thing that's encouraging. As we go through all this political stuff and all of this strife that's happening, you know, between the parties and all that stuff, as a Christian, you know that there is always a common ground. Whether you vote for this guy or you vote for that guy, there's a common ground. That common ground is God is in control of the one who is elected. God is the one who brings the election results to pass, whether that means to the detriment of our country or to the benefit of our country. And we may not understand how all of this is playing out because we're just concerned about us in our time in life 
and the things that we're experiencing, but this may be part of the puzzle that is necessary to carry out something 2,000 years down the line. And so we can have peace, we can have hope, we can have confidence, we can have joy in our lives. Don't presume that what you see is, a, is, an, is an end in itself. God works in amazing ways. Romans 11 says, Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and, and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? I hope that you have that sense as well, how unfathomable, unfathomable are the ways of God as we look at the way he fulfills history in his perfect plan. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what you have done and, and shown us through the scriptures. God, we kind of take these stories, at least I do, I can't speak for everybody, I just kind of take these stories for granted, you know, like, oh, Herod uh, wanted to kill Jesus, so Jesus goes to Egypt, and all these things, they seem so kind of mundane. We've heard them so many times, and yet when we really think about what was necessary for all of this to happen, and, and see that all of it extends back into history thousands of years, how can we not be amazed at a glorious God like you? How can we not find confidence and peace and security knowing that not only have you controlled the events of history to bring these prophecies to come to pass, but that you are controlling the events of our present history in order that your perfect plan and purposes may be fulfilled. God, help us to trust in you. Help us to have peace in you and to have confidence that though we may not see the end, you do. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Who could know your thoughts? Who could grasp your ways? Who could match your goodness or deny your grace? You awake my soul, captivate my heart, oh God, how great you are. command the laws of the universe burning bright with glory infinite in worth with a single word you ignite the stars oh God how great you are I stand in all of you. And I stand in all of you. Christ, the way, the light, the truth. I stand in all of you. What king would leave his throne, set his crown aside for his own creation, bear their sins and die? Unrelenting love, never ending grace, oh God, we praise your name. I stand in awe.
Father God. Your ways are so above our ways, and your ways are so unfathomable. Your way of thinking is so beyond our comprehension and understanding. For that, we're thankful that we have a God that works in such mysterious ways. And, um, Father God, I just ask that um, you'd help us to be a people that would secure our hope and faith in you through all seasons, no matter how things may look. God, thank you that we have hope in you. May we be a people, may we be children of God that trust you in all seasons. We thank you for all that you are. 2 Timothy 4.22 says, The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Amen, guys. Have a good Sunday.